you, Jim. I'm super honored to be here. It's been, it's been a long time since I've been on a stage, and I want to thank you for having me, giving me the opportunity to share my talk with all of you, and thank you for sticking for, with me for the next 14 minutes and 46 seconds. My name is Emilio Salvador. I'm a member of the OSPO team at Google. Um, OSPO, as you may know, is the open source program office at Google. It's a group of amazing individuals. I'm one of the newest members of the team, and the team's mission is entirely focused on one thing, which is bringing the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. At Google, we strongly believe in an open, fair, and free and safe internet. But for it to work and for us to realize and maintain that vision, there are four elements that we need to consider. Number one, first and foremost, the technology. The technology that powers internet and makes all those applications work together. Number two, which is no less important, is the people, the human component. As the community grows, and projects grow, the human component of them is more relevant today than ever before. As we bring technology and people together, we need a set of guidelines, a set of rules, a set of norms that bring those things together and make it safer for all of them. That's where the standards come into the picture. And finally, as you have probably seen in many of the sessions, yesterday, the day before yesterday, and you'll see it today, security is top of mind for everyone in this room. So let's start talking about the software, open source. And let me share with you a little bit of, I mean, Google's journey in the open source space. Um, the first thing that we have to remind ourselves, especially myself, is that Google just turned 24. And we started early, early on, as many of you, as early adopters. We use Linux, Python, and in fact, just as early as 2001, we released some patches to the Linux kernel. Our first open source project was released in 2004, just 18 years ago. I wish I were that young. So from that moment, Google's, Google doubled down on open source. What we did in many cases, we took some of our existing technologies, platforms, and projects, and we released them, and we shared them with the community. Some of them became industry standards, like Go, like Chromium, which now powers probably more than 70% of internet browsing. Android, which is... Um, if not the largest, I guess it is the largest OS, you know, worldwide, or TensorFlow, or even Kubernetes, which is probably one of the most vibrant um, communities and projects right now in this space that was released in 2014. From there, we continued, you know, releasing multiple projects over the years. On the screen, you have some of them from tools for developers like, like VHL, uh, web frameworks like Angular, uh, even new OSs like Fuchsia. We have been constantly releasing projects, but the projects that we work on and we participate in are not just Google's projects. In fact, 75% of the projects that we are participating are not Alphabet's projects. Some of them are here like Apache Spark, Arrow, or Envoy. And the work that we do in the open source space is not just about coding. There are multiple other elements that we need to factor in when we want to participate in this space as either individuals or as companies. There are multiple foundations that are supporting the existing projects. And Google has been a part of those foundations since the early days. In 2005, we joined the Linux Foundation. In 2006, we were one of the first members of the Apache Foundation board. And just about a year ago, we um, became also a member of the OpenSSF. 
we have the technology, we have the organizations, but there are also some of the things, some of the programs and initiatives needed to make this a healthy and vibrant ecosystem. Some of the work that we've been doing, and one of the things that I like the most about Google, is the opportunity that it gives developers from all over the place to participate in the open source space. Google Summer of Code started in 2005, and over the last 17 years has brought more than 18,000 new developers to open source projects. And just a year ago, the program got extended. At the beginning, it was just about new student, students and new grads. But now the program is giving the opportunity to participate to anyone who is new to the open source um, space. But our commitment to open source goes way, way beyond the projects that we just saw some of those big names uh, that we are all familiar with. I shared with you that 75% of the work that we do in open source is related to um, non-alphabet projects. But when you think about the size of Google, there's another, another number that I'd like to share with you, which is like 10% of Alphabet's employees participate in open source. There are more than 70,000 repos that have been acted upon by Google employees those 70,000, just 10,000 of them are Google hosted. So when you think about the size of the company and the number of employees, that's when you start realizing how our work on open source span multiple segments, multiple technologies, multiple, multiple industries. Just to name a few on the slide, if you go and check out our blog, you'll see some of the things that we just released in the last few months, since the beginning of 2022. We're doing things like uh, releasing new network libraries that help optimize network topologies. We have even uh, delivered a new um, library with a new sorting mechanism that improves up to 10x the performance of the existing quick sort that we can find in C++. One of the places that I, is fascinating to me is hardware. I, I never thought that hardware and open source came together and the reality is that with um, Open Road, Google is um, enabling developers and students and researchers to develop their own chips. And our, our support to that community goes just beyond the tooling, you know, by open sourcing PDKs. It says we, Google is sponsoring and subsidizing the development and the production of, of the first round of those, of those chips. There's many other many of the projects that we have been working on, on databases with El Carro that enables Oracle databases running Kubernetes. Quantum, um, quantum computing, Thirk V1 was released a few months ago, and that's Python framework that allows uh, people to program quantum computing. So you realize that the amount of work that we are doing in this space goes just way, way beyond you know, the things that we are all super familiar with. Now we talked about the technologies, the software, and the platforms that make developers or enable developers to build applications so people can capitalize on the internet opportunity. But another key element, as I said before, is the people, is the human aspect behind all those technologies. If there is one thing that always amazed me about the developer community is that no one truly knows how many developers are out there is that I've seen numbers all over the place from different sources, from 25 million all the way to 75 million developers. Um, I think that, like always, the numbers should be somewhere in between those two. But one thing that everyone acknowledges, it is the explosive growth that we've seen in open source. By any metric that you look at, either the number of projects, the number of contributors, any number that you can look around, we are seeing an immense growth in the, in the open source space. And every project and every community is different. There's many elements you know, that we need to keep in mind when we are working in those communities. It's about the size, the technology, the industry, the maturity. But what we see in Google and across the space is some commonalities in these communities. The number one, is that time spent 
in open source is split 50-50 between personal and professional time. We are all spending a huge amount of time outside, you know, our work on, on open source. Most of the people start coming to open source to build new skills, right? They want to learn a new technology, they want to learn something new, and they join a community. But then, once those skills are built, they stick because of the community. And that is almost consistent in, in many, many projects. There's nothing new here regarding time constraints. Why do people abandon? Well, there's no enough time in the day with so many things going on to stick around, um, especially when you have to maintain personal and professional and work-life balance. And the burnt out is real. Let's show with the open source space, but that is something that you all have to think about you know, when you are members of this community and work with people across the planet, right? These are the key elements that I'd like you to take away, you know, from this presentation. And last but not least, security, security, security. As I said before, we have humans, we have technologies, and now we need rules to make all these things work together. And they, that's where the standards come, you know, into the picture. In my view, to be honest with you, um, as a developer in the past, I never paid any attention to standards because they were just there. They just worked. They made things work. That's why, you know, my Bluetooth devices connected to each other. That's why Wi-Fi worked. But as technologies evolve and new technologies emerge, standards are becoming more and more relevant. And I feel that sometimes standards is an overloaded term. The way I think about standards is in, in three different ways. There's the regulatory standards that have a legal binding component. Those are the ones that everyone has to follow because those have legal implications. You don't want to break those. There are what some people call like industry standards, and sometimes they refer just to technologies that I widely use across the industry. And finally, are, we have those standards certified and validated by, by some of the entities that we have on, on the slide. IETF, ISO, IEEE. So um, this is a super complex space, and it can take a day and a half for us just to bring someone up to speed on the different bodies, the different technologies, who's working on what. The thing that I'd like you to take away from here is that the standards are becoming more and more relevant. It takes years for anyone to develop a new standard, but those standards are setting you know, the rules on how technologies are going to be used, how security is going to be implemented, and how data has to be managed. So in the last two minutes, I just want to emphasize security, you know, as something that we know is top of mind for everyone, and share fairly quickly with you some of the progress that we've been doing in partnership with most of you in, in this space. About a year ago, we announced an entire new team focused on security. There's a group of engineers at Google that is focused in bringing Google's expertise in security to the open source space. The team released a framework, a very simple framework, to help people think about how to address security and security vulnerabilities in the open source space. I mean, the framework is simple. It's know, prevent, and fix. And there are like different programs and initiatives behind some of them. In the last year, the team has accomplished a lot. And here you have just a few you know, of the things that we, we, we have announced lately. And the no, one of the things that I find extremely relevant is on, on having a standard vulnerability format right? that has been embraced by multiple communities, Python, Go, Rust, and that allows us to have a common language on how we describe vulnerabilities across the industry. That helps developers identify and know about known, um, known vulnerabilities. Second, Open Source Insights, which was a project that was released in 2021, helps developers identify uh, dependencies in their code. So as you develop in new projects, you know exactly what your dependencies are and if there are vulnerabilities that you should be aware of. Prevent is about helping developers avoiding 
you know, errors in the code or security issues. Scorecards, which is one of the first projects released under OpenSSF, is now being used on more than one million projects. Basically, Scorecards gives every project a risk score based on, on different factors. And thanks to the help of uh, coming help from Cisco, Dato, and some others, we are now scanning more than one million, one million projects. So developers can know when they are planning on using something, you know, at risk, they, they can get a risk score, a risk assessment on the, on the product or the technology that they are using. Seek Store was created to help developers sign their code and therefore understand better where the code that they are using is coming from. Kubernetes announced back in April that from now, from then on, you know, all the Kubernetes releases will be using, um, will be using Seek Store. There's more things coming down the pipe. I encourage you to visit, I mean, our blog and understand more the work that we are doing in security. We are running out of time. So there are programs to help you um, in, um, drive more security in your projects. Some of those programs give incentives to developers or security researchers to help the community improve the security of existing projects. Please check them out. Uh, I think that you all got a security key before you got into the room. Please, please start using it. I mean, it's, a, it's an easy way to start thinking about security, implementing things like multiple authentication in your projects. And it's, it's, it's on all of us you know, to work on, on security to make the internet a much safer place. And um, please um, keep it up, the good work. Thank you very much.